2004. And we are here because of his publication uh, of Getting Russia Right, which puts together uh, both his analysis of the post-Cold War era and some of the uh, shaping uh, uh, context uh, before that, as well as his own uh, uh, experiences in, in government. And so uh, we are going to have an initial conversation uh, for the first uh, 30, 35 minutes or so, and then we will uh, open it up um, for questions and comments uh, from the audience. So Tom, welcome. Uh, always a pleasure to have you here. It's a very timely book. And um, really, I mean, the first one, I suppose, is is a softball, but it's 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 a, a, a genuine uh, 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 question. I think that informs a lot of your analysis. But what was the motivation in writing this particular book at this stage in your career? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, there are two, uh, I think, basic reasons for writing the book at this point. Uh, one, I have been involved in U.S.-Russian relations now for, for about 40 years. So I joined the government in 1983, 1984, uh, spent a lot of time uh, working in Moscow at the end of the Cold War period uh, during the Clinton administration, and then had a role uh, and actually shaping the policy during the Bush administration from my position at the um, on the National Security Council staff. And now, as you look at the trajectory of U.S.-Russian relations over the past, um, particularly the past 30 years, I think I can say uh, uh, that we didn't end up exactly where we wanted to. Um, certainly after the breakup of the Soviet uh, Union, uh, you know, we didn't want, at that point, we were looking for uh, some sort of partnership, strategic partnership, perhaps, and certainly not the adversarial relationship uh, that we have today. Uh, so primary motivation is, how did we get here? What went wrong? Uh, and to look back over uh, my own experience, the experience of my, my colleagues, uh, and try to understand whether there were moments along the way where different decisions uh, by the United States may have led in, uh, in a different direction. I think you know, parallel with that, I, you know, the prevailing narrative uh, in, I think, in the West now, particularly in the United States, is, well, it's easy to explain. Putin came to power, he reversed all the, uh, uh, the reforms that were uh, ongoing in Russia at that point, took Russia down this authoritarian imperialist path, and that is uh, what upset the relationship. Uh, now, there's a certain element of truth in that. Um, I think if you look at the, the relationship after 24. 14, the seizure of uh, Crimea, the fomenting of uh, the unrest in, in eastern Ukraine. A lot of the steps that Putin uh, took uh, drove the relationship uh, in a negative direction, ultimately leading to the, the situation where we are today. That said, I think if you uh, look further back, uh, you can't absolve the United States uh, from a certain role in uh, creating the conditions that led to the deterioration. After all, policy is a matter of reaction and reaction. Uh, you know, it isn't as if um, uh, Yeltsin, certainly when he came to power, Putin had some sort of plan that he was gonna unfold uh, over 10, 15, 20 years or longer. Uh, he had some, uh, each president had some ideas of where he wanted to take Russia, but he was reacting uh, in many ways to um, what the United States was doing. So the second reason, uh, is that uh, I think it's clear that Russia is going to remain uh, a, an important power uh, in the years ahead. It's going to be uh, uh, a, a major uh, competitor for the United States. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think one needed to look back uh, to assess where we had, uh, how we had gotten to this point in order to see if we could learn lessons that would help us uh, structure the relationship going forward uh, in ways that a better advanced American uh, American national interest. So you've touched upon what was going to be my second question, which is sort of the different analytical perspectives on Russia that are out there. It's fair to say in the policy community and in academic circles, one is certainly, I think, the regime perspective, right? That the particularities of this regime, Putin's own quest for power, his insecurity, his um, you know, view of Ukrainian and, and other uh, nationality's identity or lack thereof, like these are all sort of driving forces. Um, then there's another perspective that talks about some of 
uh, the insecurities, geopolitical insecurities that Russia has perennially sort of faced. I'm going to actually uh, say so. Steve Kotkin is, is someone in this uh, camp too, and, and the way that they have to manage these various relationships and theaters and geographic as well as sort of economic uh, pressures. Uh, yours is almost a perspective about this reaction and 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 change, right? even within the same historical era. And so, you know, when I think about um, post Cold War turning points, I think about the events following 9/11, when uh, Putin was uh, really the first world leader to call up then President uh, George W. Bush. He offered support on the intelligence front, sort of military bases in Central Asia. Some would say those were his to offer, but he did so anyway. <laughs> um, and yet, a couple of years later, the relationship started to deteriorate. So maybe we'll, we'll get into the decision to invade Ukraine in, in, in later in our chat, but maybe you can reflect upon this particular turning point in the early 2000s. What happened to go from having these summits in Texas and a relatively sort of, you know, close relation, or at least a pragmatic relationship to the more sort of competitive leading to then a real kind of um, strategic competition. You're, right. You're absolutely right. I think you know, the initial years of the Bush administration, also the initial years of Putin's uh, time with the president of Russia, uh, was focused on trying to build a, a close relationship uh, between the two countries. 9-11 uh, was a, uh, I think, the seminal event in that, uh, uh, in that it created the possibility for uh, strategic alignment on the issue of counterterrorism. Uh, you know, Putin was one of the first to talk about uh, building a U.S.-Russian counterterrorism uh, counter alliance. Uh, and the administration uh, was more than, uh, I think, uh, but pleased to go along with that and try to work in dealing with what the United States then saw as the uh, the major challenge to its to its national security. Uh, you know, I think Putin entered that uh, relationship uh, with a with some assumptions about how uh, the United States and Russia would interact, and particularly with regard to the. Uh, the former Soviet space, the former Soviet Union. Well, this was never explicit in anything that he uh, said to the administration. Uh, I think it was clear that he was looking for some sort of recognition uh, that the United States would defer to him uh, in that, that, that space, that there would be an implicit sphere of influence. Uh, the United States would handle uh, most of the rest of the world, but uh, Russia uh, would take care of this territory. Uh, make sure that there uh, weren't major uh, disturbances there as far as terrorism uh, is concerned. Now, I think you need to uh, sort of understand uh, the role that this space played in uh, the, the Russian political thinking at that point. Now, this really, this region had been the source of Russia's geopolitical heft for, uh, for centuries. Uh, it was essential uh, that Russia maintain, I think, in Putin's mind, uh, the minds of the uh, Russian political elite, maintained its preeminence in this region uh, as a way of undergirding itself as a great power on the global stage. And of course, Putin uh, is a lot about returning that status after the uh, the chaos, the deep crisis of the 1990s. The relationship, uh, I think, begins to take a significant turn in the fall of, of 2000. And four, uh, and it's bracketed by uh, by two events. Uh, first is the Beslan uh, terrorist crisis uh, in September of that year. Uh, the other is uh, the Orange Revolution uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, uh, you know, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with it, the Beslan school crisis uh, basically was a situation that the emerged after a small group of uh, terrorists from the Caucasus took over a public school in this town in Beslan uh, in, in the North Caucasus on the first day of school. We all know this is a major holiday uh, in Russia. Uh, they took uh, hundreds of um, uh, Russian st students, their parents uh, hostage. There was a standoff for three or four days. Uh, the Russian forces, uh, 
then sort of claim that there was an explosion inside. We needed to storm the building. Uh, they did in the typical Russian way. Uh, and uh, nearly 400 people uh, were killed in the uh, uh, in the subsequent assault. Um, and, you know, close to 200 of them children. Well, the Russians presented this as their 9-11 in many ways. But what went on in Putin's mind was not so much um, uh, the terrorist attack, but what he saw as the failure of the United States up to that moment uh, to be a good partner with the United uh, with Russia in dealing with terrorism. The United States was focused on Al-Qaeda. For Russia, the terrorist uh, threat was Chechnya. Uh, and as we know, there was an ongoing uh, rebellion in Chechnya uh, against Moscow that began uh, in the post-Soviet uh, in, in the first post-Soviet decade, uh, this continued. Uh, and while the president of the United States had presented the world with a binary choice uh, after 9-11, you're either with the terrorists or you're, uh, or you're with us, when it came to Chechnya, uh, the position of the United States was somewhat different. Uh, yes, there were Chechens who were terrorists uh, and connected to the international uh, terrorist or to network in some way, but there are also a group of Chechen rebels who have legitimate grievances uh, against Moscow that grew out of the uh, 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 Russian imperialism, uh, colonialism, and so forth. Well, that didn't sit well uh, uh, with Putin. And so after this uh, attack, Putin concluded that uh, in many ways, the, uh, you know, the United States talked about counterterrorism cooperation was really a smokescreen for taking advantage of Russia uh, and, ex and extending American influence uh, into the former Soviet space and indeed into Russia itself at Russia's expense. Uh, the Orange Revolution uh, that comes at the end uh, uh, is uh, an event that Putin uh, and I think his people inside the Kremlin See as orchestrated by the United States, uh, and this undone uh, un, uh, un, uh, un, undoes a uh, an election uh, where Putin's favorite had theoretically won. Uh, there's a protest claims that this is rigged, uh, and the re election is run uh, again eventually, uh, and the pro-Western candidate wins this time. Um, Putin's immediate um, uh, uh, reaction is two. One, this shows sort of the uh, falsity of America's democracy promotion. This isn't about democracy and all this. Again, it's about extending uh, American influence uh, in the former Soviet space as much as uh, at Russia's expense. And two, that what the United States did uh, in, uh, in the Orange Revolution was in many ways a dress rehearsal for what it wanted to do in Russia. That is regime change. Um, an interesting uh, little... Uh, sort of factoid with this. One of the things that we did at that time uh, was pass on to the Russians through this uh, White House Kremlin channel, a list of all the assistance that we had given to Ukraine uh, all over the past several years, uh, the organizations, the non-governmental organizations that uh, we had given that money to, came out to something like $14 million. Um, we thought a, a fairly small sum wouldn't have much impact. What we learned uh, through other uh, ways, not directly from the Russians, but the way that that was interpreted uh, in Moscow was these guys are really good. $14 million mm -hmm. and they turned over, overturned the election in, in Ukraine. How much more would it have to do? Uh, would they have to put in in order to do the same thing in Russia? And these two events lead to a, a reassessment in the Kremlin of how they're going to approach the United States. Uh, the primary con conclusion is that if we are not more assertive, we don't push back uh, against the United States, it is going to clean our clock throughout the former Soviet space. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, reduce or undermine, block our ability to return as this major power uh, on the global stage. This is also the time that you begin to see uh, a growing crackdown on non-governmental organizations uh, in Russia, in part uh, in order to sort of fortify uh, 
Russia against this uh, color revolution technologies that the United States had developed. So I think 2004 really becomes the critical uh, turning point. Uh, Russia sees U.S. policy as a threat uh, to itself in that territory uh, that is most important to Russia's status as a great power uh, on the global stage, uh, and also uh, as an indication that the ultimate goal uh, for the United States is actually regime change in Russia itself. Very interesting. So one of the principal Russian not only complaints, but I would say some worldviews of the last 20 years is that they are uh, almost obsessed with this idea of the U.S. run international order. It's liberal international order, rules-based order, hypocritical based order, whatever sort of prefix you want to attach to it. Um, how seriously was this taken as a worldview and as a complaint, and in your experience, how much did it factor into policy and reactions um, to what was happening in Russia? And I want to come at this specifically from a later event, which was the Obama era reset, mm -hmm. right? And the sort of kind of assumption that you, after the uh, the war in Georgia and the Russian uh, uh, intervention there um, to go into uh, Ossetia, Ossetia, you have uh, a, a real breakdown in relations and you need to once again ramp up cooperation. Um, you need people talk about counterterrorism. There's a, probably a buried quid pro quo on missile defense there. The overwhelming assumption, I think it's fair to say on behalf of the Obama people, is that Increasing contacts once again would lead to Russia being socialized and integrated into the American led rules based system. So I'm curious in retrospect, um, um, was, was that assumption that Russia wanted to be integrated? They wanted to be socialized. Was that ever seriously questioned in policy? And, 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 and was it something that we should have taken more seriously? Would it not have mattered? You know, it's a, um, it's an interesting question uh, and a complicated one because if you look at the rhetoric of the uh, of the U.S. government from administration to administration after the breakup uh, of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, it was very much focused on integrating Russia uh, into the Euro-Atlantic community as a free market democracy. Um, I think it initially... Um, you know, that idea emerges out of the euphoria that surrounded the uh, the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the uh, of the Soviet Union, the end of history. Uh, remember, there's the gigantic struggle in the uh, 20th century between the ideologies of fascism, communism, and liberal uh, democracy. We crushed fascism in the Second World War. At the end of the Cold War, communism uh, is thrown into the dust in the history. That only leads... Uh, liberal democracy uh, as a framework uh, for uh, national success uh, in the late 20th and into the 21st century. And therefore, Russia, if it wanted to uh, maintain itself as a major power, would have to go down that path. Uh, we had uh, all the, the theories about the, you know, the third wave of democracy. Um, so this has started in, uh, in Europe and Spain and Portugal, spread through Latin America, uh, the former Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union itself, and globalization was taking over at that point. Uh, again, that reinforced this idea that if you want to succeed uh, in the 21st century, there are a certain set of rules uh, and principles that you have to follow. And so I think that um, uh, initially sort of guided uh, the thinking of certainly of the Clinton administration, but that spills over into the Bush administration. You know, we also wanted to integrate uh, Russia, and Obama picks that up uh, in uh, in two thousand uh, in two thousand and nine as well. Uh, but this rhetoric about integration coexists with this concern within, I think, each of uh, these administrations. Well, that Russia could go bad. There's always this potential that the history will come back. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, authoritarianism, imperialism, expansionary uh, policy, and we need to hedge against that. 
the two hedges uh, that were most important in this regard were um, the spreading of Western institutions eastward uh, across Europe. Uh, that is NATO expansion that begins, uh, the process begins in, in 1997 and the geopolitical pluralism in the former Soviet space, which is making sure that all those countries that emerged from the break of the Soviet Union maintain their independence. Central to that is Ukraine. Is Vignit Brzezinski. Uh, if Russia uh, uh, controls Ukraine, it automatically becomes an empire and a threat to the United States. It's separate the two, and then Russia has the possibility of uh, becoming a normal uh, nation state uh, uh, on the global stage. Uh, and so we had a rhetoric of integration uh, and a, uh, a part of a policy, a hedge um, uh, that, in fact, needed Russia as if it were going to become the Russia that we had dealt with uh, during the Cold War uh, and even further back into to Russian uh, in Russian history. Um, and we never really reconciled uh, uh, the two. Um, we did think that um, you know Russian leaders also wanted to go down this route. Certainly, Yeltsin, young reformers, talked that way uh, in the in the nineteen nineties. Um, Putin, when he first came to power, believe it or not, also talked in, in those terms. And I was seeing Gedev, uh, uh when he took over uh, as as Russian president, also talked about you know wanting to build Russia into an innovative society. We're going to be competitive in the twenty first century. And this requires us uh, not only to open up our economic system, uh, but to move the political system on a firmer foundation of democratic governance. So we were getting um, reinforcement from the, the Russian leadership, certainly in the initial stages of each uh, post-Cold War administration in the United States. Interesting. So moving on now to the events of uh, February of 2022, and and how to understand them and, and what to do about them. Uh, I think one of the immediate fallouts in the analytical and academic community of uh, Russia's invasion was that, um, you know, we should not have been surprised um, because we didn't take the threat seriously enough. And the rhetoric, the chauvinism, um, the uh, negation of Ukrainian identity. And in some ways, uh, a, a debate emerged that we had become too Russian-centric in our understanding of the region. We had viewed developments in this part of the world through a Russia-first angle that blinded us um, to uh, the revanchism um, that was about to take. I'm, I'm, I'm curious in how you would respond to that, um, and especially given sort of your criticism of U.S. policy um, should we not um, support the sovereignty and independence of these other states? Um, you know, what lesson do you draw from the lead up to 2022 and what we missed? Okay, look, I mean, first of all, uh, I think, you know, the, the view that we, that our policy was Russia-centric um, is probably holds true for a very brief period. Um, in the post-Cold War era, the Clinton administration. And certainly, um, and you think about the Clinton administration in its first months in August, in, in office it talked about building a strategic alliance with Russian reform. That really was going to be the focal point uh, of its policy. Um, but, but I think two or three years into the administration, um, there was sufficient pressure uh, in the United States itself, certain things that we're hearing elsewhere in the world, um, that uh, led the U.S. government to believe that it also needed to develop and take seriously uh, the other former Soviet states. And Ukraine was obviously a focal point uh, of that. Uh, in the later uh, part of the Clinton administration, you see that what we do with Russia, uh, or what we do with Ukraine, it parallels what we're doing with Russia. Um, so we formed some sort of um, uh, Russia-NATO uh, committee at, um, uh, at NATO. Uh, we do the same thing with Ukraine, slightly less um, uh, uh, elaborate than what we did with Russia. Uh, we had this Gord Shorter Mirton Commission, yeah. um, but we did something similar with the Ukrainians. Every time a senior American official traveled to Moscow, they tacked on a trip to, to Kiev. Uh, 
uh, again, to demonstrate that we were aware of the uh, the differences. If you look at the Bush administration, um, you know, there was a tremendous effort um, to uh, develop relations with the uh, the various states of the former uh, Soviet Union. Some of them were critical to what we were doing in Afghanistan at that point. Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example, Georgia, Georgia becomes important because that's the corridor into the uh, region. And we're also building up the relationship uh, with with, uh, with Ukraine, again, as a counterweight uh, to Russia at that point. Uh, you know, strangely, that might have changed a little bit with the, with the Obama administration, mm -hmm. uh, in part uh, because they did put issues like Georgia and Ukraine on the back burner uh, because they wanted to focus on rebuilding this relationship with Russia. And you also remember that the signature uh, sort of uh, global initiative of President Obama in the first years is this world without nuclear weapons. If you're doing a world without nuclear weapons, the focus has to be uh, Russia. These other things become uh, sort of problematic uh, in, in terms of the, the relationship. So the short answer is, you know, we were aware of this. We were aware of um, how this uh, how this factored in in, in Russian thinking. Uh, I think, you know, particularly for the Bush administration, uh, there was a clear desire to bolster the independence ties with these countries as a way of limiting uh, Russian power going forward. Less so when you look at uh, the Clinton administration uh, or, or the Obama administration. So, following the invasion, we have um, a very rapid response in part of Washington, Brussels, London, and we see really unprecedented coordination of central bank sanctions, freezing the Russian assets, uh, export controls for Taiwan, South Korea, countries that have not been part of these regimes. We see what was, for me, surprising, I'd be interested in getting your take, um, the, the, the response from the corporate sector is really a, one of mass pullout um, in responding to the stigmatization of Russia. What happened, you know, companies like BP, ExxonMobil, as well as the consumers, Ikea, McDonald's, um, Pizza Hut. We see on the Russian side, then the banning of social media. A lot of those IT workers leave and really um, the departure of whole classes of journalism independent media and so forth. So us pulling out expulsions on that side. And so now this, you know, the whole question, and, and I want to get to what, you know, what is to be done about the situation now and and and, and, and how we should um, think about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, you know, the current effort. Um, but what has this done to sort of the ability to uh, even engage with Russia and on what terms and, you know, and, 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 and what's your view on just like the ecology now of what it means um, um, to uh, negotiate, um, understand, engage, all of these things that uh, we took for granted, but frankly, we failed at <laughs> given the outcome of 2022 in this current moment. But look, I mean, for all practical purposes, um, there is no uh, positive engagement between Russia and the United States at this point. I mean, the engagement comes through um, the support that we're providing the Ukrainians uh, in their uh, in their battle against the uh, Russian aggression. Uh, you know, there are, for all practical purposes, no substantive, sustained substantive uh, official contacts between Washington uh, and Moscow. Um, Foreign ministers have talked, I think, once in the past two years, and that's a 10-minute conversation on the sidelines of another international uh, multilateral uh, forum. Uh, there have been no conversations at the at the presidential election since before Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, there have been some conversations between our national security advisor uh, and his counterpart on the Russian side, uh, but those have been episodic uh, and not uh, filled with a great deal of substance in my understanding. Uh, and the, the two uh, embassies 
the Russian embassy in Washington uh, and the American embassy in Moscow basically remain isolated. Um, very little contact uh, with the uh, with the with the with the governments on each side. Not to speak of the uh, the actual people. Uh, and so I think this is a, uh, a a problem in the relationship. Our ability to understand uh, what is happening in Russia uh, uh, today has decreased dramatically because they have almost no journalists uh, reporting out of Moscow at this point or anywhere uh, in, in the former uh, in, in Russia. Obviously, they're dangerous with that, as we see with Evan Gershkovich, um, and that has put, put a damper on this. Uh, we don't have the business contacts uh, that we once did, so there's no uh, sort of communications going along those channels. Uh, and there are very few Americans who travel to Russia and very few Russians who travel uh, to the United States. Um, so uh, in many ways, uh, we are operating in the dark when it comes to uh, an understanding of how the other side is thinking, what its red lines are, uh, what the possibilities are uh, for uh, resolving the conflict in Ukraine in a way uh, that is satisfactory from the standpoint of American nationalist interest uh, and moving this relationship, often adversarial, uh, uh, adversarial track uh, to something that is more con constructive, again, from the standpoint of, uh, of advancing American national interest. I think it's fair to say in the early months of the conflict, there was concern among some of the administration here over the potential for escalation and involving NATO um, and stray missiles falling in Poland, Romania, drones, right? The whole thing. And, that, and, and, and that led to the initial sort of reluctance to arm Ukraine. And that starts changing over time. Um, and Ukrainians are advocating for more um, um, supplies. They say they'll use them responsibly and that they're indispensable um, to, a, to, um, you know, to achieve their campaign and achieve a strategic victory. Um, very interesting reporting from both the FT and the Wall Street Journal over the last month where the ammunition deficit right. Ukraine now faces is really stark. So over the summer, Ukraine uh, had an advantage of about 7,000 to 5,000 rounds of ammunition uh, a day compared to Russian counterparts. And now that ratio is 10,000, 2,000 the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine's having to conserve uh, right. ammunition. Um, and some would argue, well, now that we're doing this, we really are in, uh, 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 if you don't want to use the word proxy war, certainly a war where the the West has committed to support Ukraine and needs to see this out. Mm -hmm. So how does that need to maintain commitment and support um, for Ukraine on the ground, uh, given what the military situation is and the deteriorating situation, some would say, uh, for it versus um, the need to find a way out of this um, that will be lasting um, and that will not only advance um, U.S. national uh, national interest, but will preserve core principles of Ukraine and ensure that Russia doesn't do anything like this again in the future. Right, the credibility of commitment uh, is a huge issue when we talk about possible ceasefires, Korea-style scenarios, and so forth. So it's a lot to throw at you, but right, exactly. You it's that. A, it's a, um, you used to say this was a sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? But that's almost jump change today. Yeah. So it's. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, look, I mean, it's a complicated uh, uh, process. There are two parts to this. Uh, so one is, um, you know, a continued uh, American effort along with our allies to support Ukraine in the military aspect of this also, um, you know, the financial and humanitarian support that it needs uh, to demonstrate that, that we are in fact committed uh, to Ukraine's sovereignty and independence going forward. The second, but that also means to be parallel with the diplomatic tr uh, track. And we need to be talking to the Russians in some way if we're going to be able to find out uh, a, a, a way of resolving this conflict that can lead to a more durable relationship uh, between uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, Europe, Russia, and, and the United 
states. I think it's important to remember uh, that from the Russian standpoint, uh, this conflict clearly is about Ukraine, but it's not only about Ukraine. Uh, they see themselves as engaged in a broader conflict with the West, uh, and at stake from their standpoint is the, the future of European security uh, architecture. Uh, so we need to engage that in some uh, in, in some way. Now we can think of sort of sort of various scenarios how you bring this to a um, uh, to a satisfactory end from the standpoint of our interests, uh, the interest of our allies, the interest of uh, of Ukraine. One of the things that I find curious uh, about the conflict right now is that without, with the exception of the Ukrainians, nobody really has articulated a concept of victory. Uh, how do we know when we won? I mean, Ukrainians are quite clear uh, that uh, they want to liberate their territory um, that Russia seized since 2014, reconstitute Ukraine within its borders in 1991. Um, is that the position of the United States? Uh, we haven't really said this uh, in, in so many words. Same thing is true of the Russian side. Um, it's hard to, uh, for us to, to fathom what the Russian uh, definition of victory is. Uh, Putin went in, it's denazification, demilitarization. Um, what does that mean? Uh, is there a territorial dimension to this? And after all, uh, one of the rationale for for launching the uh, invasion was to protect the rights of Russian, uh, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, how do we know when the Russians, or how does Mo Moscow know when it's won this conflict and so forth? Um, uh, so uh, we need to, I think, first uh, in the United States decide what it is we're actually trying to achieve uh, and what we're prepared uh, to do to achieve those goals. Uh, it's clear uh, that uh, that Ukraine is not a vital interest for the United States because we're not prepared to go to war, right? That's a, a self-limiting uh, uh, factor on, uh, on the part of the United States. Uh, you know, the president has made clear from the uh, very beginning of this, even before the conflict began, that we would not put boots on the ground. We are not going to uh, engage in any type of activity uh, that would... Uh, raise the risk of a uh, military confrontation between Russia and, and the United States. We've also put limits on what the Ukrainians can do with the weapons we provide, right? So you've got a strange sort of conflict uh, where, um, you know, uh, Russia, uh, for the most part, uh, can fight this conflict having a sanctuary. Uh, the Ukrainians are beginning to step up the tax on Russian territory. Uh, but not nearly at the scale that you would have expected this sort of pull-out um, conflict. So we're fighting this war largely on Ukrainian territory and Ukrainian uh, airspace. Um, again, because we don't want uh, uh, Russia to escalate uh, in a way that uh, leads to a confrontation between, a direct military confrontation, uh, confrontation between the two countries. Those are your limits, and what can we hope to achieve here with the Ukrainians? Uh, and that, I think, becomes um, sort of where we are at this point, you know, particularly after the failed counteroffensive, uh, the difficulties we see in raising uh, money in Europe and the United States. How are we going to define success in this endeavor? What is achievable over what, uh, uh, what period of time? That, that's my final follow-up before we turn it over to the crowd, is actually the, the debate and the planning that's going on for repurposing frozen Russian assets for the reconstruction. What are some of the relevant issues involved and trade-offs the policymakers are thinking about now in Washington and Brussels? As I think the, the idea was to have a plan for this at the G7 level um, or the second year anniversary, but if I'm not asking where things stand, but, but what are some of the you know, the real issues that are being discussed around this plan. Because in theory, it sounds simple, right? Take these frozen assets, <laughs> 350 billion right there, transfer them over, the American taxpayer in an election year uh, won't have to pony up. Yeah, right. Uh, and you get the increased discussion of this as it becomes more difficult uh, to get the funding through Congress that the administration uh, is asking for. Uh, first, 
It's a legal question. Can you do this in a way that is consistent with uh, with legal practice uh, in Europe and the United States? I mean, we are technically not at war uh, with Russia. So under what uh, uh, set of uh, legal arguments can we justify it with not seize, but uh, not, not freeze, but seize these assets and turn them over to Ukraine? Um, and so... Um, and, you know, you're seeing that debated out in public. Um, it's clear that uh, if you're going to go down this right, you're going to need legislation that will provide the uh, legal uh, grounds for, for the seizure of the assets. Uh, the second thing that is being debated is what are the consequences of doing this uh, for the international financial system? Um, and what does it mean for uh, the the future of the United States as the international reserve currency, uh, the dollar as the international reserve currency. What, you know, are countries going to um, hold their reserves in Western banks and American banks uh, if, there's a, if there's the potential that the U.S. government, when it decides it doesn't like what, um, what you're doing, that it will seize these assets and <clears throat> turn them over for what... Uh, whatever purpose, either the American taxpayer or to uh, the country that has been uh, been wronged by uh, uh, by the rival that we see on the global stage. I think those are sort of the two key uh, issues that are, are being debated. Uh, you know, where I come down on this is uh, that I would proceed very cautiously in this regard. Uh, the international financial system as it's been structured uh, since the end of the Second World War, had, uh, undergirded American power. Um, and uh, we should not hastily, uh, because of a sort of current problem uh, with the Congress of the United States, um, take a step uh, that could damage uh, our, our position in that system or the system as a whole going forward, uh, in an effort to solve a, an immediate problem, actually erode the foundation of their own power over the long term. So I think it's something that needs um, more debate. Uh, it's clear that the Europeans are behind us and they're thinking about this. We're really the ones that are out in front. And I think that grows largely out of a domestic political problem, not being able uh, to get the, uh, the funding out of the Congress that we think is necessary, despite the fact uh, that uh, if you look at this, uh, by most accounts, there is a bipartisan majority, both the House and the Senate, that would support this, but there's a small group of fairly uh, right-wing uh, Republicans that, for their own purposes, uh, are blocking what we think is a critical uh, amount of aid to Ukraine, especially at this moment. Yeah, that could be the topic of another sort of seminar that we right. have here. Okay, so you've all been very patient and listened to us go on. So let's open it up for your questions and comments. Just ask you, please identify yourself uh, before you ask your question, which I will repeat for the mic or condense. So, Peter. Thanks, Alex. Um, thanks for coming up. Fantastic talk. Always good to see you. Um, Peter, tell us who you are. Of course. Uh, we all know who you are, but. <laughs> yeah, and I know who you are. I'm going to teach here. I teach at Post Division Security Policy. Policy, foreign policy. I spent a good part of my career at CIA and I think Russia, which is how we're pushing the economy. So, my question, um, I have to ask this. I'm in AIDS and a very interesting debate with some colleagues in academia um, about what are the bigger strategic implications of Putin's invasion of Ukraine? Thinking strategically down the road of Russia's future, uh, and I don't buy into the question, but I think although it clearly has huge problems, some have argued that Putin's invasion has actually created a serious strategic failure for Russia, and there's three particular points to that argument. One, ostensibly we went in to stop NATO enlargement. And actually now we have two new members of NATO, and we've added 830 miles of territory with Finland on the Russian border. Not really smart success. Second, the demographic problem. If you consider the number of Russians dying in the war, the people who fled the country, they continue to decline in the birth rates, which Putin openly acknowledges. 
what kind of a future does that foretell for Russia decades down the road in terms of our ability to sustain a population to, you know, run into power? And then the third one, which is very interesting and debated, uh, the relationship with China. Some would argue in this strategic failure debate that uh, China, that Russia is now a supplicant to China. It's, still, it's not only the junior partner, but it's actually becoming even more dependent. Um, and the idea that it would ever be able to reintegrate, as it were, in the West, that Putin had basically made his bed, he's going to lie in it. He's never going to be in the West. And he says that pretty openly. So I'm just curious your thoughts about this argument about Putin as a strategic bed. Not another 64,000. No, no, no. Look, I mean, uh, I tend to think that it's a, uh, a major strategic blunder. Uh, at this point, for the reasons, at least two of the reasons that you mentioned, the demographic problem was going to be there in any event. You may exacerbate it um, by, uh, you know, adding uh, additional uh, deaths that are unnecessary. On the other hand, if you keep the territory, uh, you get three or four million people. So um, that's sort of a, a wash, if you put it sort of crudely at this point. Uh, but he has... Uh, sort of unified the West in a way that it wasn't, um, uh, certainly uh, in recent years, um, created a, a, a much stronger uh, sort of NATO uh, inside uh, in, in Europe that is going to be um, well, not necessarily problematic for Russia going down the road, because after all, NATO is a defensive alliance. I mean, we're not planning on invading Russia uh, anytime soon. I've never seen any plans uh, to do that. But what he has done is, uh, and this relates to your second, uh, the second element of China, uh, uh, is yes, Russia, uh, because it's isolated from the West, has become much more dependent uh, on China. Um, you know, there are certain uh, good strategic reasons why Russia is aligned with uh, uh, China. Their views on the world order, they're both under pressure from the United States, you've got complementary economies and so forth. Uh, but there are also, I think, a significant downsides from Russia as it's dealing with China. The asymmetry in economic growth, uh, you have an, uh, an economy uh, in China, depending on how you measure, anywhere between eight and ten times as large as the Russian economy, that economy and that it's going, gap is going to grow over time. Technologically, uh, the Chinese have probably uh, surpassed the Russians uh, in recent years. Uh, they are trying to do something uh, in AI, for example, that is probably beyond Russian capabilities. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, Russia is worried about its relationship with China uh, over the long term. Uh, and you see, uh, at least as part of Russia's policy, an effort to repurpose some of the organizations that were built in the 2000s, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS uh, are the two most prominent ones, as a way of creating a web of uh, relations that constrains China's ability going forward. The strategic problem that, uh, for Russia is that I don't think that you can create a sufficient, reliable counterbalance against China among the countries of Eurasia, the global south. Your only reliable uh, uh, counterweight is the West, and particularly the United States. And so Putin, by his, uh, his the invasion of Ukraine, for whatever reasons he under, uh, uh, undertook, it, isolated himself from Europe, increased his dependence uh, on China, and he is in a position psychologically and politically where it's very difficult for him um, to rebuild that relationship uh, with the West. That said, I think the strategic logic is such that a successor to Putin uh, will come to that conclusion and find, uh, find a way back of rebuilding uh, that relationship. I would also argue uh, that it's actually an art, a strategic advantage to have a working relationship with Russia as well. So the strategic logics in both Washington and Moscow over the long term work towards some sort of reconciliation doesn't need to be partnership, we'll probably still be competitors, but have a, a, a more constructive relationship at this point. That helps us deal um, with the problem, creating global balance. Um, that's 
is China, but is also um, uh, the type of relationship we'll have in the Middle East. Indeed, it's uh, the type of relationship we're going to build all along uh, Russia's periphery uh, in Eurasia. So strategic blunder, I think clearly, uh, and I don't see Putin being able to fix it uh, on his own, given his, I think, uh, men, uh, uh, mentality, his mental, uh, his, his mental state at this point, uh, and uh, where he's positioned himself politically. Great. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Eli. I'm a student here at the Harriman Institute. I'm curious about the Balkans, where there have been repeated warnings that Russia may be trying to stage some provocation in northern Kosovo, or that secession in Bosnia is likely uh, with Mueller and Dodik and Srpska. Do you think that these events are appropriate to view through the prism of Russian foreign policy or Russian efforts to destabilize Europe? And do you think it's likely that Russia's uh, going to engage in more aggressive actions like this outside of Ukraine? Okay, Balkan, so let's take a second question here. Hi, my name is Adam Storch. I'm also a student at the Herman Institute. I'm curious about the term strategic partnership that you used uh, at the beginning of the talk um, that did not happen from the U.S. perspective. So I wonder what a strategic partnership with Russia means for um, the U.S. administration, because it's a rather broad term that um, does not imply any concrete goals. Great. Thank you for that. So, yeah. one of the, uh, the Balkans, now look, first, most of what's happening in the Balkans is happening for indigenous reasons, right? Uh, the problems that we see between uh, Serbia and Kosovo at this point, the problems in Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, is there a Russian interest uh, in sort of exacerbating that to some extent? Uh, I, I would think almost certainly yes. Um, sort of create another problem that the Europeans have to deal with uh, that would uh, uh, distract from the, uh, the rapport in, in Ukraine at this point. Uh, you know, that said, I don't think it's a central point of their uh, uh, their policy at this point. They really are focused on uh, on Ukraine, um, um, uh, re-engineering the Russian economy to provide the types of uh, support that will need to conduct that conflict uh, over time, uh, uh, preparing Russians themselves psychologically for a, a longer uh, a longer conflict. Uh, you know, the last thing that Russia needs at this point uh, is a um, another conflict along its borders. I think it has its hands full uh, with Ukraine at this point. So I tend to uh, uh, play down those uh, those types of uh, initiatives, particularly now. Strategic partnership. Um, I mean, you know, the fundamental idea is that uh, that two countries share uh, a uh, a sufficiently common view of how the world operates, what the challenges are, that they can begin to cooperate across a broad set of issues. So, um, you know, the elements of strategic partnership from the U.S. standpoint, um, uh, say in 1990s or the 2000s, would have been uh, one counterterrorism that we're going to work together in dealing with this international counterterrorism or this uh, international terrorist challenge. Um, we would cooperate in uh, in the diffusing of regional conflicts as they emerged, particularly along Russia's uh, periphery in Eurasia. Uh, we would cooperate in building a a durable uh, European security architecture. Uh, you know, we would uh, work together in preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so cooperation in dealing with the Iranian nuclear program, the North Korean uh, nuclear program. Uh, we would look um, to see what uh, ways in which we could uh, in a joint fashion, advance our interest in space. Uh, so move beyond the International Space Station to other types of efforts uh, in the cosmos. Um, there were thoughts of how you could cooperate in uh, dealing with um, uh, various types of health issues. Um, uh, pandemics, for example, uh, building on the 
uh, scientific capabilities in both countries to, uh, to develop viruses and so forth. So there's a broad range of things uh, that we were thinking about. Uh, if you want sort of a, um, a sense of what the Bush administration is looking at, uh, you look at the joint declaration that the two presidents issued uh, in the spring of 2000 and, uh, 2002 that really lays out the broad framework for partnership uh, between the United States. It has a geopolitical element, it has an economic element, it has a, um, a humanitarian element to it. Yeah. Okay, I want to go online and then I will come back for another cluster of questions here. So online, first question is from Colette Schulman, uh, who you <laughs> know very well, yes. uh, and uh, makes a comment about uh, uh, the war dragging out in Russia and nourishing elite discontent um, and uh, then goes on to put it in the uh, terms of a larger question with uh, many countries able to interfere in others' domestic affairs. Can a line be drawn between unacceptable interference, for example, attacking critical infrastructure and elections, and tolerable interference? I know you've been thinking about cybersecurity in the context of Moscow. So what are your thoughts about interference and is it possible to have red lines and different workable norms? Uh, well, you know, the first point is uh, that, you know, in the current global si uh, situation, given the technology that we have, the means of communication, uh, is that interference is almost inevitable. Right? You know, years ago, uh, we used to believe that uh, you could say one thing uh, to your domestic audience and say something entirely different to yeah. your foreign audience. That doesn't work. Sociologists call that multivocal signaling, right? right? Like, yeah. That doesn't work yeah. uh, that way anymore. Uh, so that has uh, complicated it. Um, you know, it's hard to, um, you know, avoid making comments on uh, what you think about the, the policies of another government. Um, and if you do that during an election year, yeah. that's sort of interference and so forth. Uh, you know, I think the, the challenge here uh, is to engage in a set of talks and negotiations where you be, try to delineate um, the what is tolerable interference and what crosses a line. Um, you know, theoretically, um, uh, you could argue that Anything uh, that uh, would uh, be aimed at regime change, overthrowing the regime, that crosses the line. Right. Um, now, what does that mean in practice? Practically, that would be uh, sort of an issue. Um, you know, obviously, I think interference. Um, uh, again, you're not talking about um, when it's critical infrastructure. That's not interference in the politics. That's going after the. Um, uh, the economic foundation uh, of a society. Uh, I think anybody uh, and any, every country would consider a tax on critical infrastructure as crossing a, a line. That's a no-no. Uh, that's in many ways uh, could be considered an act of war. Uh, uh, again, depending on the, the scale and the intensity uh, of that. Um, so. You know, I focus this more on the question of political interference, um, where the line is of it, uh, of interference or comments about the um, the other society in politics that are tolerable. Where does that pass over into a uh, a uh, an effort actually to undermine and erode the foundation of the foreign of a foreign country's regime? Yeah, very interesting. So the second question online from an anonymous attendee um, saying that in academia, Russia has been a main focus. Um, and especially if someone looks at East European studies or Slavic languages mainly focused on Russia, how can academia change and decentralize from teaching Russia's colonial tendencies in our universities? And I asked this I mean, because it's, it's, it's on the mind in general, these academic discussions, and we've had these also in the UC, but also someone who has set up a program on this part of the world is this a question of balance and perspective across countries, or is there something more fundamental here about um, you know, the inflection and refraction points through which we uh, look at the politics of a region? Right. Well, 
look, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to demand. Right? And I think, uh, you, know, you know, you look at this region, it's more than Russia, clearly. Uh, and uh, you make an argument that, I mean, I, I look at this from the uh, standpoint of a policymaker. We need to know about Ukraine. We need to know about Uzbekistan. We need to know about uh, Poland and so forth. Uh, but uh, how would you sustain those programs uh, in the academic world? Uh, you know, when I uh, was in college many, many years ago, uh, there wasn't a great demand for courses in Polish, Polish history or Polish language and any of these European countries. Um, you know, maybe you can sustain, we've been able to sustain some interest in Central Asia uh, for some time. I mean, Ukraine at this point. Uh, but I think the, the reality is uh, that Russia uh, is a much bigger sort of player on the global stage, uh, has a much more central role in sort of scientific discovery, uh, a larger role um, in um, uh, in the cultural realm as well. So it's, it is going to attract attention. And the question is, how much interest can you generate uh, in these other countries uh, to sustain a focus study on them uh, o over time? Mm -hmm. You're getting a lot on Ukraine now. That will last for some time. Um, uh, one would hope that you could generate sufficient support that that would uh, endure for, for many, many years in the future. But there's always a possibility that will become uh, something similar to what the way Poland figures in our uh, in our thinking at this point. Mm -hmm. And you just have the, uh, the student demand to, to uh, sustain this over time. I also think a critical area studies program work that's solved, which of course here we are. It's not about what countries you study. It's about also looking at all the processes that inform your assumptions about the region. Right. It's in academia, it's in journalism, it's in policy making. Those could be geopolitical, could be university political decisions, right? They could be um, different sort of, you know, popular assumptions, portrayals. Um, they could be different agents, right? We used to have debates in Sovietology, you know, Emigre scholars would focus on nationality issues and right. say, this is really important. And our own Sovietologists, some in this room would say, no, that's ridiculous. It's all about party. It's all about structure and so forth. So that kind of 360 perspective on the sources of inputs, right. right? That shape and structure our knowledge, I think is just as critical being aware of that as also, you know, who you're studying and then sort of at, at what point. Um, let's open a cluster here. Uh, I want to make sure I uh, get a minute. So let's take these three. Let's start with you, gentlemen, and then in the back. Uh, I'm Shanessa. I'm a first year student at SIPA. So I just want to probe you about something you had mentioned earlier about there being no um, substantive contact between Moscow and Washington, certainly from a political and official standpoint. But there's a lot of um, alt right groups within the US who have connections to Russian ideologues. Um, and I just want to sort of ask you about the implications for this on both sides from a policy perspective and a democracy perspective. Yeah, great question. So let's. Uh, that one, yes, that is a good question. Uh, my question actually dovetails with your previous discussion. There's a lot of debate and there's a lot of uh, literature that's been generated about frustration with Old Europe being early and embarrassed. And uh, discussions have arisen where. Uh, uh, the center of gravity for power in Europe is moving eastward, uh, where it would be possibly between Sweden and Poland. Uh, it will be the largest concentration of F-35s outside of Alaska shortly. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, Poland is an emerging economy and emerging military power. How much of this is talked? How much is this real projection? Okay, thank you. That's the last one here. Bye. And I happen to be based at the Master University, which also connects to the question of I wanted to ask you. You know, in recent months, I think the most significant development uh, in Europe has been that the EU seems to be seriously committed to adding Ukraine as a future member. It was very ambitious plan, and this is not going to happen tomorrow. 
I was wondering if there are any major concerns from the point of view of US foreign policy when it comes to when it comes to this plan, or is it essentially uncontroversial, something that can be fully supported? Okay, and let's do one more. There's an American election uh, coming up. Uh, <laughs> really? Um, can you comment on uh, the U.S. Uh, Russia relationship and the unfortunate event that Donald Trump did in the election? Okay, great. So, four really weighty sort of yeah. questions here. The summer relationships between them all right networks, balance of power shifting in Eastern Europe, um, Ukraine and the EU and U.S. interests, and What's going to happen in November? No, November. I said, we know Putin is going to win Russian presidential election in March. The question is, will he win the American presidential election in November? Uh, and that's not necessarily simply a, uh, a Trump victory. Uh, it is the disarray that might emerge uh, from a, a very close uh, election in the United States uh, that leads to a long period, an unsettled period, as we try to sort out uh, who actually won the election uh, and who is going to be inaugurated in January 20th of next year, um, and whether there will be uh, this will be accompanied with a, um, a significant amount of uh, political climates or not. Um, you know, what I have heard from senior Russian officials is they don't expect. Uh, a significant change in U.S. policy going forward towards Russia, no matter what happens uh, in November. Whoever uh, is elected, the relationship is bad at this point. Uh, the assumption is that it's going to continue to deteriorate. Uh, 2016, they had different uh, expectations of Trump. All those were disappointed uh, during Trump's four years. No matter what his rhetoric was, Policy of the administration was actually fairly hard on Russia. We look at sanctions, uh, expulsions, of diplomats, and so forth. Uh, so, um, you know, other than the likely um, sort of sort of disarray that we get from uh, uh, a, a Trump's management style, um, which may provide certain opportunities for the Russians. Um, I don't think that they're looking for a president that is going to give them the types of things that they uh, want. It would be more distraction than it would be actual acts of, uh, of commission. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the long-term strategic goal of the United States uh, should be uh, the emergence of a strong, independent sovereign, prosperous UK anchored in the West. Um, and, and the EU is uh, is clearly uh, a part of that, certainly when you get to the, uh, the socioeconomic and political side uh, of things. It also has a security element as well. Um, you know, the question, I think, is how long the process will take. Um, whether the uh, EU is going to be flexible enough, um, you know, during that long process, provide Ukraine some of the benefits of ben membership uh, before it is formally a, uh, a member as a way of encouraging the Ukrainians to continue along what's going to be a very difficult uh, path of economic reform, political reform, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, so I have some concerns about that, and I'm concerned about what the Ukrainian reaction will be, uh, you know, after uh, a long conflict where there's been tremendous sacrifice, um, and then they think they're running into the resistance uh, from uh, Europeans and uh, in bringing them into uh, in, into Europe. Uh, how does the Ukrainian body politic uh, react to that? Um, you know, look, for example, uh, at the way the polls in particular have dealt with agricultural issues at this point. One of the biggest issues and one of the most difficult to resolve in any uh, European accession problem is the agricultural issue. Uh, you know, the common agricultural policy the cap. Um, Ukraine uh, has a large and potentially very rich agricultural sector how that is going to uh, play in Europe, 
uh, how much money they're going to get, what the implications are for Poland, uh, Slovakia, and Hungary. Those are big questions. French farmers as well, by the way. Those are big questions. Uh, and so I would hope that the Europeans themselves are thinking about that um, because it really would be, I think, tragic from the standpoint of uh, Europe, Europe's interest and Ukraine uh, for this process to break down uh, because of inflexibility on the uh, on the on the European side. Um, the question on we have, uh, transnational alt right networks between the U.S. Yeah. and Russia. Yeah, that means there's a little bit of that, but um, uh, I think people pay attention. Uh, to that, but I don't think it's having a dramatic impact on um, what's happening here uh, here in the United States. Um, you know, by and large, uh, I think Russian efforts to um, to interfere uh, in in U.S. domestic politics, either through cyberspace or through these types of relationships, um, while it's something that we need to. Uh, we need to pay attention to and monitor quite uh, carefully uh, pale in comparison to the uh, domestic problems that we've created on, a, uh, on our own because of our inability um, to overcome the polarization uh, in, in our politics. So, yes, monitor, but um, I don't see that as a, as a major concern. Uh, for the United States at this point. And then again, the question here just to uh, the center of uh, gravity for power. In oh, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Sweden and Poland. Well, uh, well, you know, the United States has always placed a great deal of, um, uh, I guess, hope in what the Poles would do uh, and the uh, and the types of support that they would provide and in, in, in countering what we've seen uh, than less than enthusiastic French and at times German uh uh, enthusiasm for our positions in NATO uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, I don't think you're going to see a, uh, you know, there will be a, obviously a movement in that direction. Uh, Poland and Sweden will be important players uh, in Europe, but Germany and France are still critical. I mean, Germany uh, is will remain, if they can get its economy together, uh, sort of the economic powerhouse uh, in Europe. The French bring significant military assets uh, to the table. What you'll see is a more balanced uh, relationship between the East and West so that the Germans and the French, you know, it won't be sufficient to get the Germans and French together to derive European policy. Uh, you're going to have to bring in uh, countries like Poland uh, and Sweden into the central councils uh, of um, uh, of European uh, policy, but also even inside NATO. Um, uh, you know, Sweden and Poland will be major factors that the French and the Germans are going to have to deal with. I think that's good from uh, from America's standpoint. Uh, it would be even better if the, the countries could actually reach some consensus on, on how to develop their defense industries and their foreign policies uh, going forward uh, and create a, a genuine uh, sort of pillar, European pillar inside uh, the transatlantic uh, alliance, uh, which would I think bring strategic benefits to, uh, to Europe, strategic benefits to the United States, and actually in some way uh, ease our common problem of dealing with the Russians going forward. Okay, well, we are actually at time. Um, we're going to, we do have the room for another 15 minutes, so allow you to interact with Tom informally if you would like. Get your copy of the book signed. Again, the book is Getting Russia Right. I uh, want to thank everyone here for joining us and also online. Yes. We'll take this. Thank you. Pleasure, yeah. So we can get some food, really. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this. I don't know, I have to get the latest numbers. Yeah.